Sir Tony Brenton, thank you again so much for having come to be with us here in Berlin for the lecture, uh, for the wonderful session we had already with the young leaders. We'd love to take the opportunity now to ask you a few more specific questions about soft power, cultural diplomacy, the European-Russian relationship, and also beyond. My first question for you, when one looks at the European-Russian relationship, uh, or let's, let's even go back to the Cold War, there tends to be a leaning in the direction that really hard power is really what counts. Uh, it's about the economics, it's about the trade, really that's in the end what's going to be the decisive factor and also sustaining or even determining relationships. As you look at, let's say, the European-Russian relationship now and towards the future, do you see a role for soft power? Do you see a role for cultural diplomacy? And if so, what kind of a role? Uh, what kind of an impact do you think that, let's say, cultural diplomacy could have in the future of the European-Russian relationship? Yes, of course I do. I mean, the Russian government is a pretty hard-headed organization. And for them, a lot of it is about trade and security interactions and so on. But as you turn your attention to the Russian people, you are dealing with the people who have been sort of locked away in a sort of prison for the past 70 years, who are still enjoying being able to get out, and who feel quite European, who are looking for friends on the western end of their continent. And the more we can, through um, cultural exchanges and you know, cultural activities of that sort, show ourselves as being open to them, welcoming to them, viewing them as part of the European family, so we are influencing them to take a, a more a gentler view of our motivations towards Russia in other ways. And that, I mean, the Russian government, of course, is not democratic, but it cannot ignore the views of its people. If we can win over significant segments of the Russian people through cultural diplomacy, that plays into the hard, the hard diplomacy. And then I wonder, I'm just reflecting back to your time when you were the British ambassador also to, to Russia. Maybe you even saw examples where really culture did have the ability maybe to transcend borders or affect citizens. I mean, there seems to be a transition in culture diplomacy where, let's say, old school culture diplomacy very much was about presenting our countries. You know, Europe is like this, Germany is like that, Russia is like that. Uh, some of the newer trends that we're seeing is actually exactly what you were saying, really opportunities where citizens can get together with citizens. So would you have, let's say, a suggestion of maybe a model of culture diplomacy that you saw that worked uh, or something that you think could be interesting for us as an institute or for the young leaders to consider if we really wanted to have an impact uh, on citizens. Would you have an example maybe that comes to mind? Well, I have an example. I'm not sure it's very much use to you, but one of the things that all uh, educated Russians are obsessed about is Shakespeare. So, and I'm a big Shakespeare buff, buff myself, so, and I developed a little talk on Shakespeare that I gave around Russia. I'm the only British ambassador who's ever been published in Vaprosi Literaturni in, in Russia. And I found that had a fantastic effect because I was talking about something that they were genuinely interested in. They sort of think of Shakespeare as one of theirs. And that built links, and there are now links between the theatrical communities and beyond them, Russian productions come to London and to, to the rest of the UK. British productions, of course, go to Russia. And that builds up, through cultural links, a sort of broader understanding. Maybe you should do a, um, a seminar or something on the cultural impact of the, the international impact of Shakespeare. I'll come back to you on that idea. My colleague also wanted to ask you a few questions. Yeah, we have a few uh, specific questions about the uh, European relationship to Russia. And the first question I had was, um, during the conference UK meets Germany, uh, last April you mentioned that if one wants to understand the future of the European Union, one has to take into account the role that Russia plays in this relationship. My question is, to what extent do you feel there's a project of common space between Russia and Europe? Well, there's, there's a bureaucratic project. I mean, there's a thing called the Partnership and Cooperation Agreement, which has been in, interminably under negotiation between Brussels and Moscow and is still under negotiation between Brussels and Moscow. And I find it very hard to place high value on that. I don't think that those diplomatic negotiations are going to go anywhere. I think it is much more important, on the one hand, as I say, to build up cultural and social links, get Russian students over. That's the other thing your institute can do. Get Russians in here to meet their fellows. That makes a huge difference. And at the other level, building up economic links. The more Western companies invest in Russia, the more Western companies use um, Western in institutions for their financial activities, the more trade there is between the two sides. That itself builds the mutual understanding and persuades the political authorities that they have an interest in strengthening political links as well. And do you think that Russia would eventually join the um, WTO? <laughs> I have been involved with Russia since 1994. 
And the question of whether Russia will join the WTO tomorrow has been on, off, on, off, on, off in all of those 17 years. For the moment, it looks on. Um, for the moment, the best informed opinion, which I am not a member of, is predicting that they will join later this year. I very much hope so, because it would be a very good thing if it happened, and it would help the trade links I was talking about. But I wouldn't bet my shirt on it. Well, let's change the topic then. Um because in 2008, Russia attacked Georgia, and U.S. officials have designated the Russian attack as dispro disproportionate. Um, do you believe that the use of strategic bombers and ballistic missiles um, by Russia was not only a way to overrun the Georgians, but also a way to show off to Europe? I have a slightly different view of what happened back in 2008 with regard to Georgia. And you will recall that at the time, all the European governments condemned Russia for starting the attack. And they were then obliged, slightly shamefacedly, to hold an investigation which demonstrated that the initial assault, which was on South Ossetia, was from the Georgian side. And what you saw was a Russian reaction to a provocation which they, they could not not react to. Now, I think there's a certain amount of... Um, self-protection in the claim that what happened was disproportionate. If you're fighting a serious war, you use everything you've got. Uh, and the Russians did. Mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, there were atrocities, although a rather limited number, on both sides. It, it was a, it's a shame that it happened. But we need to be quite clear that the initiator of it was Georgia, not Russia. Okay. You want a follow-up question? Or? Yeah, huh? Okay, and the other question is about energy. Um, with the Nord Stream being built, um, Europe will get more easy access to Russian gas. And um, on the other hand, however, uh, Europe is increasingly focusing it, its attentions on um, developing alternative forms of energy. Um, how do you think the relationship would change between Russia and Europe if Europe starts depending more on those alternative forms of energy? Well, I mean, Russia is very keen to maintain the energy relationship. And what North Stream is all about, and there's another, there's a South Stream project as well, there are a lot of projects, is precisely to get over the difficulties that Russia had exporting gas to Europe through its spats with Ukraine back earlier this decade. Um, from the European side, those spats, which did cause gas cutoffs, um, have led to the conclusion, and I think it's the right conclusion, that if you want guaranteed energy security, then you need to draw on a diverse range of supplies. Hence the Nabucco pipeline plan to get gas from, from Central Asia, the tbilisi kehan plan, similarly, which is now actually in, in operation. Um, and I think Europe is very sensible, however well-intentioned Russia may be, to look for lots of diverse forms of supply. I've done energy politics for a long, long time, and people have constantly announced the dawn of renewable energy. That's another thing, like Russia joining the WTO, which has been going on forever. I hope that it will happen, but I think it's going to be slower than everyone anticipates. And then one last follow-up question. What do you think would Russia's future look like if Europe no longer depends on its gas? Oh, I mean, Russia... In a sense, Russia's future would be improved. Part of Russia's current problems is that it is too easy to get money out of oil and gas. And that has therefore diminished their appetite for domestic economic reform, for dealing with the obvious problems they have, like corruption. If suddenly the oil and gas sales prospects were less, then they would have to do more about domestic economic reform, which would be to their huge benefit. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your interview. Yeah, no, thank you very much, Sir Tony. It was an honor to have you here, and we very much look forward to your lecture in a few moments. Thank you.